Um, I'll just go ahead and uh, welcome you to our environmental experts uh, webinar series. It's been uh, uh, implemented since January uh, and it's been very popular. So uh, we're really glad about that. Tonight's talk is on whale conservation in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And our guests are Dr. Ryan Friedman and Jessica Martin. And I have someplace here a little bio to read. Okay. So Dr. Freeman first joined the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary science team in March of 2014 as a California Sea Grant fellow before becoming a federal employee in 2020. His research background covers a wide range of topics, including addressing, addressing coastal management concerns using a variety of spatial and quantitative techniques. And, uh, what screen got in the way? There we go. In 2019, he completed his uh, doctorate degree at UCSB, where his research uh, quantified human impacts to sanctuary resources, uh, uh, focusing on climate change and cetacean ship strikes. Ryan is enthusiastic about his, uh, working alongside resource managers and scientists to address the needs of the sanctuary. Jessica Morton uh, is a resource protection uh, specialist affiliate for three national marine sanctuary, Channel Islands, uh, for Dell ba uh, Bank and uh, Greater Fairlawns, where she helps uh, coordinate whale conservation work and uh, directed at reducing the risk of ship strikes. Her research and resource protection background includes population and behavioral field research, work on both sides of uh, the US, both, co both coasts, focus on humpbacks, North Atlantic right whales and killer whales, as well as policy research evaluating associated uh, or impacts, evaluating impacts associated with marine uh, fishery management strategies. She holds a Master's of Arts degree in International Environmental Policy and a concentration in Ocean and Coastal Management from Millbury Institute of International Studies in Monterey. And she has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Environmental Science from Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. Get around. Um, so uh, with that, we're up to about 100 participants on Zoom, which is nice. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about Channel Islands restoration. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we do habitat restoration contracting. So a lot of people will hire us to uh, do work in places, places all over Southern California. We do environmental consulting and environmental education. Um, we've uh, been honored to take out over 3,400 school kids to the Channel Islands, and we also work with uh, kids on the mainland. Uh, we've worked in over 80 restoration sites up and down the coast, really from uh, all eight Channel Islands and from the LA County uh, through Ventura and Santa Barbara County is where we've done most of our work. Um, we're also really uh, proud of spearheading the campaign recently to save the West Mesa of the San Marcos foothills from development. Uh, you see it there in the bottom of the slide or part of it. It's uh, 101 acres that had permits for luxury houses. And we initiated a campaign to purchase the property from the developer and a whole lot of community members jumped into uh, make the campaign happen in just 90 days. Uh, and we had over 5,000 donors. So um, if you're interested in supporting our mission, uh, that's the website to go to, cirweb.org slash donate, or just go to cirweb.org to learn more about us. And of course the donate button is prominently placed there. Uh, so uh, we uh, appreciate your support, especially as we start entering the year-end fundraising season. 
Uh, with that, I will stop sharing screen. And who am I turning it over to, Jessica or Ryan? Jess is going to run it. Yeah, okay. I think it's coming to me. One second. So thank you everyone for taking the time to come learn about some of the work that just I've been doing. Um, the Sanctuary program is a really unique uh, program within NOAA where we protect special areas or what we like to call America's underwater treasures. And our group is usually focused on a certain place. And so because we're small teams, we get to work together uh, I come from a research background. You heard um, my little intro. I have a PhD um, that was looking heavily at research and Jess comes from a policy background. And one of the really neat things is we get to work together very closely on a number of projects to make sure that when the work that I'm doing, the science I'm doing matches with some of the work that Jess is doing to advance the ball on a number of different resource management. Um, so I'm really excited to sit, share this really neat story with you. Um, Jess, can you hit the next slide? And you have um, something in the screen. So if you want to move it to the left, like a page marker, maybe. Did it go away? No, it looks like a Word document. Just slide it to the left. Um, so what Jess has up on the screen right now is the National Marine Sanctuary System. So if you're tuning in from anywhere else but California, you can see that there's national marine sanctuaries all around uh, the U.S. waters. Um, in California, there's four sanctuaries. You can see Greater Fairlands, which recently expanded up in the Mendocino County, Cordell Bank, which is an offshore bank uh, off of uh, Sonoma County, Monterey Bay, which many people are familiar with, is one of the larger sanctuaries covering Monterey Bay up to San Francisco, and Davidson Seamount, which is a big offshore seamount. Channel Islands is my home sanctuary, which is co-located with the Channel Islands National Park. And we protect six nautical miles off of the Channel Islands. So that's why we got linked up with Channel Islands Restoration. Um, the system has a number of different goals, but we have uh, regulations that keep out development of oil and other commercial interests. And then rules and regulations are kind of tied to what the place needs. So in Florida Keys, there's a lot of coral reef restoration, um, at Gray's Reef, they do a lot of connectivity mon monitoring. And for the California sanctuaries, one of the major focuses is cetacean research and cetacean protection. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Jess. So again, I pointed out, these are the five uh, sanctuaries on the West Coast. You can see kind of at the top, I'm sorry if it's coming through faintly, there's Olympic Coast up in Washington. And we're in this unique position where four uh, three of the five sanctuaries are contiguous. They kind of have similar borders and Channel Islands um, is just to the south of the Southern California Bight. And because we have this tightly coupled network of these protected areas, we share a lot of the same resources. A lot of the research that I've done in the past looks at how animals move in select habitats. And so this applies not only to whales, which people usually think, have, think of as moving really far distances, but sharks such as white sharks and some of these bigger basking sharks that we think of as well as small sharks like um, soup fins or smooth hounds, they can move really long distances as well. Um, we also have a number of large fish that we've been tracking and moving, including giant sea bass. Um, and these resources, as they move up and down the coast, are affected by a number of different things, including ambient conditions, the water temperature, where the food is, so forage fish like anchovies, um, and all number of sorts of things which are going to be affected by climate change. So we're looking at how these animals use these habitats in order to better protect them into the future. And we're gonna use the network of the sanctuary system to be able to make sure that these animals are able to persist over the long term. But this shared resource means that these sites have to work together. So as you saw in the intro, Jess works with a number of different sanctuaries to implement the program that we're gonna be talking to you about today in order to best protect whales into the future. So the policies and programs that we do to make these resources, we're working towards a healthy ocean. Sanctuaries is really unique in the fact that we like to think about the whole ecosystem in a place. So some agencies are really focused on a fishery stock or a, a, they manage to a certain degree. We have a wide mandate to think about the health of the ecosystem overall, which is part of the reason I really love working in sanctuaries. 
Next slide. So here we're talking about three uh, whale species, which we find up and down the California coast. If you've gone whale watching in California, you've likely seen at least one of these uh, species. Blue whales all the way to the left, um, they are the world's largest animal. Um, they're really neat. And if you've ever seen one in person, just incredibly flat, breathtaking. They have a really small population, about uh, 1,500 individuals, and they're listed as endangered. The population is has recovered, but there's some conflicting work showing that the population is not recovering as fast as some of these other groups and has sort of reached a stalling point at that 1500 number. And that is due to a number of reasons, potentially entanglement or ship strikes, which we're going to talk about, but their recovery has been stunted compared to the other two. In the middle, we have fin whales, another whale that gets hit by ships. Um, they have a larger population of about 8,000, but are also listed as endangered. And then humpback whales all the way up to the right. People have seen them. They're the ones that breach out of the water. Um, they can put on quite a show and give really neat behaviors. Uh, they have about 2,000 to 3,000 individuals in their population, but they're split among two populations. There's an endangered population and a threatened population. And that is based on the split of where they come from to where they go in their summer and winter foraging grounds. I'll show you how in a second. Next slide. So this is the humpback migrations. You can see that they're found throughout the world, but on our coastline, they come from Central America and Mexico, and then come up our coastline up into Washington, or go up our coastline up into Alaska. And that is how you have those two different populations that are genetically distinct. Um, as they kind of come through, they feed in California waters. So for those that are familiar, California is an upwelling area. And so what upwelling means is, as the current comes down, it pulls water away from the coastline, which allows cold, nutrient-rich water to come up from the bottom. And that's what defines the California ecosystem, but makes it really, really productive. So there's lots of food for these animals as they come through, and they spend a good chunk of the summers feeding in national marine sanctuaries because of that. Next slide. The other population we're talking about is blues, which you can see follow a similar long coastal migration and uh, also feed um, in, uh, in sanctuary waters. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a population that's been slow to recover, especially for our uh, Northeast Pacific population. Um, and again, they're moving across this coastline, but Southern, for anyone that's been out and seen Southern California or even Northern California, you can look out and you see the oceans full of other uses. Next slide. And this includes a number of different aspects of human use, including oil rigs and uh, other uses. But I'm going to let Jess talk about these biologically important areas. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so just to really piggyback on what Ryan just shared and emphasize how important the California coast and really the whole U.S. West Coast is for these species of concern. Um, on the screen here, you will see maps that identify the important feeding habitat for blue whales. Um, that's on the left labeled A, and then humpback whale feeding habitat is labeled B. Um, and these important feeding areas that you're seeing have been identified as biologically important areas for these two endangered whale species. Um, and one thing you'll note, if you look to the right in that third map in map C, there is definitely a lot of overlap between these important feeding areas that we see for these species and the national marine sanctuaries that exist along the West Coast. Um, and you'll also know from these maps that there's important blue whale habitat concentrated mainly in California, so areas all the way from San Diego to Point Arena and up to Fort Bragg are really significant feeding habitat for blue whales. And then for humpback whales, as you'll see, it stretches much further along the US West Coast with respect to feeding areas, um, but definitely a concentration around the Channel Islands area and offshore of Morro Bay. And then really important areas for humpbacks off of Monterey Bay and San Francisco, all the way up through Oregon and also Washington. One one thing to yeah. note, and, and yeah, one thing to note in those biologically important areas, there's been reports of up to 500 blue whales feeding off San Miguel Island. So when you think about a population that's 1,500 individuals, you're talking about a third of the population being 
concentrated in the one space. And if that area gets disturbed, you can make disproportionate impacts to the populations. So as I said before, there's a number of really big human uses that happen in the off the California coastline. Um, the ports of LA and Long Beach are some of the most trafficked in the world. We have the, one of the number one imports. We have the largest port in the United States is that port complex. And we have tons of ships coming through Southern California and from China and also moving from Southern California to other ports uh, along the West Coast, including San Francisco, San Diego, Seattle. Um, so we have these basically major highways going through these important areas. In addition to those ships, they make a lot of noise. So in the same way that when you're walking down the street and there's a jackhammer hitting the concrete, you're not going to like that sound. And so a lot of the big ship noise you can see here in this graph is this primary shipping noise between 10, kilo, 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz. That's within the listening ranges of all those marine mammals that you see there. So it's basically pushing the sound um, and giving these whales essentially a headache. And in addition, you can see the picture on the right, there's also a risk with entanglement. So traps that we put out for lobster or crab, as well as nets that are used in, uh, to catch fish, they sometimes can entangle whales. And that leads to the whale either getting tangled up to the point where they can't swim, or they drag this netting and it becomes a really big issue as whales migrate up and down the West Coast. Um, we have a big whale uh, entanglement team that NOAA has that goes and actually tries to cut this material off whales. And it's a big effort. So when people see or report these whales, um, there's a big team that kind of travels up and down the coastline. And Hawaii also has one as well that'll cut these um, netting off. And I'll let Jess take it away. All right. So um, as Ryan was just sharing, entanglements are a problem along the US West Coast and also in California. Um, and we're going to focus on ship strikes today, but I did want to just take a moment to acknowledge and highlight this other very major contributor to large whale mortality on our coastline. Um, and so that's the entanglements in fishing gear, both active fishing gear in the marine environment and also lost gear that's floating in the marine environment. Um, and rather than just throw numbers at you, I'm going to just share these maps that hopefully are coming clearly through your screens. Um, but they are from our NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service partners. Um, and I think they give a pretty alarming and good visual on how prevalent of a problem the entanglements issue has been and has become. Um, and so what you're looking at is 2000 through 2019. Um, and like I said, I mean, it's pretty alarming for me personally to look at these maps and see how often this issue is being observed and recorded along our coast and also within National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, and one thing I definitely want to highlight as you look at these maps, and one major challenge we face with entanglements and all whale mortality data is really our inability to quantify exactly how much this is really happening um, and effectively determine how big of a problem it really is. Since gathering the evidence on these events in the ocean environment is really difficult, um, and we know we miss cases where entangled whales don't get seen or don't get documented and make it into the database that you're seeing here on this map. Um, so as you look at this map and as we share data with you tonight, uh, definitely keep that in mind that recorded fatalities with large whales, um, one thing we're always questioning is how to interpret this recorded data that we have available, acknowledging that it's only a small percentage potentially of the total actual events taking place. Um, but I will say before I leave the entanglements side of things on the horizon for the entanglements work, um, colleagues from our colleagues of ours from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, which manages and oversees the state's fisheries, um, and along with NOAA sanctuaries and other partners, they're definitely much more heavily focused on the entanglement issues in recent years than they've ever been. Um, they're working really closely with the fishing community to try to figure out new gear developments um, that can reduce the risk of entanglements occurring. And then in addition, if any of you are Dungeness crab lovers, I know my family is, you might have noticed that the crab fishing seasons in California have been limited um, in recent years due to the continued presence of humpback whales, mainly feeding in our coastal waters. So 
there is a lot of attention and work uh, being placed on addressing entanglements, but I'm gonna keep us moving. And so moving to the main focus of today's talk, um, which is ship strikes, and actually starting with continuing on the theme of the challenge of having limited data. Um, on this slide, you'll see two maps of data for along the California coastline. And this time, the dots that you're seeing represent the ship strike events instead of entanglement events. Um, and so what you're seeing represented in those colored dots are the location and the number of recorded and documented ship strike events from 2009, uh, or sorry, 2007 to 2020 on the left, and then 2009 to 2019 in Southern California on the right. And once again, like with the last slide, uh, you'll notice I'm using words like recorded and documented on these maps that you're seeing since like with entanglements and even more so actually than with entanglements with ship strikes, we know that the number of events that we're actually able to document happening is probably only a percentage of the total actually taking place since most of these whales are probably sinking after they're, they're getting hit and after they're getting killed by those collisions. Um, and so like with entanglements, I will just note as we head into this overview of the work that we do to address this issue, that the lack of certainty that we have on this data is definitely a challenge. Um, but we know for sure that the ship strikes are happening. And so as you'll see on the map, we've recorded and documented 49 fatal ship strike events on endangered whales in California between 20, uh, 2007 and 2020. Um, and recent work from great research partners from Point Blue Conservation Science have uh, used encounter models to try to quantify exactly how many ship strikes are really happening. And so the data from that research su suggests that it's about 80 endangered whales that are killed by ship strikes each year along the US West Coast. And definitely the large majority um, of those predicted events are taking place in California waters. Can I? Um, so as Ryan mentioned, um, for populations like blue whales along the California coastline, which take a really long time to reach sex sexual maturity and also have a small population that haven't shown really great signals that they're recovering. Um, losing nine plus blue whales to ship strikes each year can pose a really serious problem. And that's what's currently estimated for the Southern California region. Um, and that's especially something to consider when you also remember that entanglements are contributing mortality to the problem as well. well one thing I'm gonna add uh, to that slide before Jeff moves on is you are seeing a big ocean and a lot of people are probably wondering, well, why doesn't the whale just get out of the way or not use that space? And what you have to remember is this is a really, really large animal that typically doesn't have any predators. So when you see a bear in the woods, your first instinct is to run, even though that's not what you're supposed to do. And that fear response doesn't really, ha we don't think really happens for these whales. So they don't really understand that there's something out there that can cause mortality. And that lack of response is what leads them to get hit, despite there being a large overlap or potentially places that these animals can go. And that is part of the reason that these animals get hit so frequently is that we know that the responses or the diving behavior in response to an incoming ship is pretty limited, which is why you are seeing such high numbers of strikes on this, this population. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. All right, so um, why is this happening? I think we've kind of covered this already, but to really hone in on, hone in on the issue, um, we really do just have this issue of overlap right now um, in our region and many regions globally. Um, and I think one of the best ways to explain this overlap um, is with maps, and clearly I really like maps, but the maps on the screen that I'm showing you right now are giving you predicted density of blue humpback and fin whales along the US West Coast. Um, and the areas that are showing higher probability of whales are shown in red. And then if you look to the right, you'll see a density map of shipping traffic along the coast of California. 
Um, and if you do a quick back and forth comparison of the two, you'll see there's unfortunately a lot of overlap areas of the high concentration of vessels and then also the areas of high concentration of shipping. Um, and so we not only have coastal species like humpbacks and blues that are feeding closer to shore in those areas of high density you're seeing all around kind of hugging the coastline, but we also have fin whales, if you look at the fin whale map at the bottom left, um, that are overlapping with where the more offshore shipping traffic is taking place. Anything on this one before I move on, Ryan? Go for it, keep going. All right, so what is NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries doing to address this overlap and the confirmed threat uh, to endangered whales in California waters? Um, so currently there's three main approaches, if we're gonna put things under umbrellas that I'll quickly take you through today. Um, and first is reducing the co-occurrence of whales and ships. So actually separating ships from these areas where we know the whales are going to be and have been in the past. And the second is what we're gonna spend the majority of the time focused on today, if we can speed things up, and that's on slowing traffic down in these whale feeding areas by establishing voluntary vessel speed reduction zones. And then the third is by supporting ongoing related research um, just to inform and enhance the ongoing policy efforts. So first and pretty quickly, because again, we're gonna focus more on the vessel speed reduction efforts that are currently ongoing, but um, when examining these potential management options to address ships hitting whales, um, it's definitely the case that the best solution whenever it is available is to separate ships and whales entirely. Um, and it's really, really hard to relocate whales, especially when they're hungry and they're looking for krill or bait fish or whatever is bringing them to the region in the first place. Um, but we do know that it is possible to also move shipping lanes away from whale whales, or away from where whales are. Um, so in the past and then in actually present, NOAA has thought about and is thinking about how and where to relocate shipping lanes in the region to areas uh, where we know whale concentrations are lower. So what you're seeing on the screen are examples of changes that were made in the past in 2013 to both the San Francisco Bay region TSS, um, that's on the left, and then also the Santa Barbara Channel TSS, that's on the right. And with the San Francisco Bay region, the lanes were extended and they were narrowed away from areas of high concentration um, of whales. And the work, uh, the research work that was done to examine that suggested and predicted that that reduced overlap by 60% in the region when that was done. So that was actually a really significant conservation win. Um, and then in Southern California in the Santa Barbara Channel, very similar work was done. The shipping lane was narrowed and then moved away from where we know there are these important feeding areas for blue whales. And NOAA sanctuaries are definitely continuing to look at this, um, definitely since shifting and warming ocean conditions are changing the distribution of where whales are. Um, this is something that constantly needs to be examined and looked at. Um, since new solutions come up as the whales move. Um, and so currently we have proposals right now submitted to the International Maritime Organization. That's a UN body that manages and oversees global shipping and also establishes the official shipping routes. Um, and so we have a proposal in for Southern California to actually extend the lanes further than what you're seeing on this map um, and also expand areas to be avoided, which are basically no-go zones or these large ships protect even more whale habitat. Um, and then for San Francisco region, we're actually in the process of re-examining the configuration of the lanes. Um, but one thing to note with all of the spatial solutions associated with this work, these shipping lane attempts, um, is that even though they're well worth it and they can sometimes significantly reduce 
uh, the risk of ship strikes occurring because different species are in different places in the region. Unfortunately, it's never a silver bullet solution. Usually, if you're gonna displace traffic to one area, it's gonna disproportionately affect one species over the other. And so, keeping that in mind, um, the other main approach that we're gonna highlight uh, most tonight is slowing large vessel traffic down in these critical feeding uh, habitats and areas. And that's using voluntary vessel speed reduction requests. <clears throat> and so what it is, is just like it sounds, um, it's nothing necessarily groundbreaking, but we're looking to slow down these large vessels to 10 knots or less, um, since we know it reduces the risk of a fatal ship strike occurring to these species by 50% based on research that's been done on the East Coast. Um, and essentially it's uh, giving these whales a fighting chance of avoiding and also surviving these collisions with what at this point are essentially skyscrapers that people are driving across the surface of the oceans. These are enormous vessels um, that make blue whales look very small in comparison. And so on the East Coast, um, for North Atlantic right whales, which is a really critically endangered population, ship speeds are regulated to protect um, that population and make sure that ships are slowing down. Um, on the West Coast, we have this voluntary approach with speed requests. And so what you're seeing on the screen are the zones and the charts that we work with with our Coast Guard partners. Um, and this is what we use to actually communicate out to the public and then also to all mariners. Um, and we ask all of the large vessels, 300 gross tons or larger, to slow down to 10 knots or less in these areas. Um, and you'll see at the bottom that there are timelines established with when we're asking ships to slow down. And that's mainly based on uh, when we know that the whales are present in the regions. Um, and then in Southern California, that timeline is actually pretty regularly adjusted um, since the whales no, don't necessarily stay on a set schedule. Um, and so sometimes we have whales arriving before that may start or staying past the November season deadline. So it's really actually a dynamic uh, based season for Southern California on those VSR requests. Um, and then we put out these requests and determine later if anyone's listening to, to us and actually adhering to these slow speed requests. Um, so I will move forward and pass it to Ryan to talk about AIS data. So AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. Um, and it was set up long time ago to basically keep ships safe from each other. So the ships, as you can see here, I have this like little happy ship carrying his like bananas or pineapples or whatever. He's on his way to Long Beach. He's like hustling along. He doesn't see the whales in front of him. He's like living in his own blissful world. But the, all these ships are required by law to have this AIS signal come out. So that's the radio frequency that tells us what the ship's name is, what its identification number is, how fast it's going, the direction it's going, where it is right now. And it has to continually blast out this radio signal. And so originally it was to make sure that ships weren't going to run into each other and you weren't going to spill a bunch of cargo into the water. But um, now we use them and we collect them from a number of different stations. So we have stations all over the US and these terrestrial radio collections basically collect this information and aggregate it into a data stream. And when we can't see them, so, and it has to be, sorry, it has to be done by line of sight. So you need to be able to, the radar needs to see the antenna that the ship is actually projecting this information from. And sometimes it leads to shadows. So for ex example, at this Channel Islands, um, when traffic was rerouted due to this change in air quality rules, a bunch of traffic started going into the south part of town. And that meant there was big shadows where we didn't know where ships were going to be. Then we started using satellites to start to track this AIS data. And satellites have their own issues because the satellite's got to be overhead. It can't be on the other side of the globe listening for the wrong thing. And so when we combine these data sources, we actually have a complete picture of global transit at any given time. And you can look at this too. So if you go to marinetraffic.com, I have a little inset there of San Francisco Bay. You can pick 
your favorite place in the entire world and see what container ships are traveling at that moment. And we have this data stream of millions and millions of lines of ships and how fast they're going. And we can put that into these transit paths that Jess has put up here below. Um, and we can use that to look at if ships are complying with what we're asking them to do, they're actually going slow. If they're deviating from that uh, traffic separation scheme, which Jess talked about, which is basically this highway, which are put in for a ship's own safety. So if they come out of this, there's actually loss of, uh, there's financial penalties to their insurance and different things. So it's a good way to make sure that the rules of the road per se in the ocean are being respected. And we can use this information to understand and test out if the if the voluntary or as Jess would talk about incentive-based management styles are doing better at making sure that the ocean is safer for whales. Take it away. All right, so using all of that AIS data that Ryan was explaining um, to determine the speed over ground values um, for all of these large vessels that are transiting within our region. Um, we work with our NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service colleagues um, and also the US Coast Guard since they supply really high quality AIS data. Um, and we actually, as Ryan was explaining, we actually analyze how many nautical miles are being traveled at this target speed of 10 knots or less. Um, and that's out of all of the large vessel traffic mileage that's taking place. And so what you're seeing on the screen are the cooperation levels that we've seen in recent years with these NOAA voluntary vessel speed reduction requests. And so as you'll see in earlier years, especially in Southern California, cooperation has been extremely low, um, below 20% in 2017, which is embarrassing and sad. Um, but even sadder, I should also note when you consider that there's a percentage of traffic in the area that's already going 10 knots or less. So we know that voluntary cooperation in those years were virtually non-existent when we look at active VSR season on versus the months when it's not. Um, but thankfully, if you look at that table, you'll see that in later years, we have started to see a significant bump um, in voluntary cooperation across this large vessel traffic. And so uh, we are above 50% in both regions in 2020 but we're definitely not achieving uh, the cooperation levels that our research partners estimate that we need to really significantly reduce ship's rate mortality and also maintain optimal sustainable populations of these species. Um, so uh, definitely positive to see the trajectory, um, but we're keeping an eye on that and we're constantly communicating to industry that we're hoping that goes up. Um, and I think we attribute the increase in cooperation to a lot of increased engagement. We've definitely upped our game in terms of uh, communications with industry. We generate company specific statistics for all of the large vessel operators in the region um, and let them know essentially how their fleets are performing and that we're paying attention to this and we care about this issue. Um, and a picture on the right actually on that slide is showing you an image that was sent by one of the container vessels because at this point, um, actually many of them contribute whale sightings data along their transits. And in this case, they actually gave us a photo, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but the other reason that we believe that we've seen such a big bump in cooperation in recent years with this voluntary speed reduction request is um, that we've established this incentive-based program that we've helped champion with pretty amazing partners. Um, and so I showed you data through 2017. Um, if you were to look back to 2014, it wasn't much better. And in 2014, Channel Islands recognized that it was getting really low cooperation with the voluntary requests. And so it uh, set out to actually establish a partnership with air district agencies in California um, and create this incentive-based vessel speed direction program in the hopes that hopefully we can motivate some higher cooperation levels with these NOAA vessel speed reduction requests. And uh, motivate and incentivize 
Um, and this program's case means two things. One is uh, financial incentives with grant funds that are managed by NGO partners. And then the second is really this positive press element for demonstrating um, that these companies have made a high level of commitment to this effort um, and giving them uh, positive PR and marketing associated with that commitment. Um, and so the maps that you're seeing on the screen right now should look pretty familiar. They match almost exactly, actually they do match exactly with the NOAA VSR zones that you saw on the charts that get communicated out to all mariners and all large traffic. Um, but for the incentive-based program, it's only open to container and car carrier lines that transit in the region. And that's for several reasons. One is that they dominate the majority of the traffic. Um, they're historically the largest, uh, sorry, the fastest, I mean, large vessels uh, in the region. And we also know, which is really crucial for this program, uh, we know that slowing ships down um, within these types actually uh, not only achieves whale protection benefits, but also achieves these air emission reduction benefits. Um, so it's very similar to like with your car, that if you drive at lower speeds, um, your car is more efficient in terms of fuel, the ships are the same. And so there's a lot of emission reduction benefits associated with slowing vessels down. Um, and so this has really been as a result of that benefit, it's really been a collaboration and a partnership with the California Air District Agency since the beginning. Um, and Can I know one you... thing, Jess? Yes. Sorry, go back. So one, uh, two things to note on this slide, we chose 10 knots because below that speed, mortality for whales drops significantly. So if you get, if a whale gets hit at 10 knots or below, its chances of survival is much higher than if it gets hit above that speed. And that's also below the speed where you get these maximum air quality benefits. So as Jess pointed out, we partnered with the air quality control districts because in Santa Barbara, um, we were actually over NOx emissions by EPA standards for a county of our size. And over 52% of NOx emissions came from these ships alone. And that translates into things people really care about. That translates into lung cancer. That translates into asthma effectiveness. Um, so we've made this really unique partnership with these agencies to try and achieve both of our missions because the impact from these big cargo ships is not only just for the whales, but also for the people on land. It was severely impacting air quality. And you can see where they end at the port, this yellow line down in Southern California the ports of LA and Long Beach have already done that to achieve that their air quality emissions and it improved air quality in the region extremely well. And so we just kind of extended that program in 2014 and then took it up to the bay later on. So that's why we use that kind of speed to basically get this maximum benefit for the whales and the air quality as well. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. So um, piggybacking on what Ryan just shared, just to share a quick summary on what we've seen over the recent years in terms of growth and benefits in this program. Um, this slide has a whole bunch of cool stats in my opinion, but I, I think the most important takeaways here are that the program seems to be working. Um, we're seeing continued growth in enrollment in this effort as you'll see in the third row of the table. Um, we started with seven companies in 2014, we're up to 16 in 2020, and now we have 18 of these container and car care lines enrolled in 2021. Um, and at this point, those 18 represent 90% plus of the container and car carrier traffic that's taking place. Um, so we know that we pretty much have all the major players at this point, um, and that's really wonderful to know. And then in addition, we are also seeing some really major carrier companies like, I think the notable one for us is MSC, which is soon to be the biggest container line in the world is really clearly prioritizing this effort and continuing to achieve very high levels in the program. 90% um, cooperation levels pretty much every year since they've decided to do it. And in addition, I mentioned there are financial incentives associated with this program. Um, I'm happy to report that at least half of the companies now 
um, that are eligible for these financial awards have decided to just give the money back. Um, and we've framed it as we'll put it towards research um, and they can receive additional positive press. And that seems to be really motivating for the companies involved. Um, and also notable in this table, as we've mentioned, really huge benefits, at least I'm told, I'm not an air emissions person, but in terms of air emissions reductions with this program, I'm told that the nitrogen oxide reductions are really significant. So over 700 tons reduced in the 2020 program. And then you'll also see that in the last couple of years, we've been able to work with modelers to actually estimate the reduction in ship strikes that we're seeing achieved by these specific companies with their enrolled vessels in our program. And so you'll see there's a 35% reduction in risk associated with these vessels based on their slower speeds in 2020. And then one more thing to note, it's not just a dual benefit that we found with slowing these ships down in these areas, but there's also a third benefit that is there's underwater noise reduction that happens. And so thanks to partners at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, we actually now have stats on the sound levels um, or the decibels decreased, I should say, um, from these vessels from slowing them down within this program. And so that's really cool to see. Back this to you. Yeah, so I'm going to show you a series of violin plots. So that I know it looks really kind of messy, but just stick with me and I'll walk you through them. Um, so over on the left, we have a series of years at the bottom, and you can see that kind of like violin shape. So the fatter the violin is, the more transits that happened at that range. So at the top, you can see it comes up to about like 20 or 30 knots. That's a really, really fast ship. But you can see that the bulk where the violin is the fattest is kind of in between this like 15 knots, which is this yellow band of dotted lines. The red band is at 12 knots, which is what the incentive program was originally set at. And the black band is at 10 knots, which is that kind of lower whale mortality risk. So we picked 12 in the beginning because that's below, that's the sweet spot for air admissions. Um, but we later brought that down to 10. But you can see as time goes on, that fat part of the violin keeps getting lower and lower and lower. And what that means is through time, ship speeds kept getting slower and slower and slower, which means that with the implementation of our program worked to kind of make traffic safer for whales through time. Um, to understand the active side, that blue means that we had an incentive program in place. And you can see in some years, like 2016, when we have this incentive program, we have more ships traveling below that 10% line than during the inactive time period, so that yellow. So we're seeing that when we put in these incentive programs, we're getting greater compliance, we're protecting whales better than compared to these times where we're inactive. And we kind of conglomerated that into two big violin plots in the upper right. So the blue, dark blue is that active time period. And you can see there's two bumps around that 12 knots. And that's because as fuel gets more expensive in the same way that we all are feeling our pain at the pump, the whale, the shipping companies feel that too. They came down to that 12 to maximize fuel efficiency. And that's just because gas is expensive these days and no one wants to spend money, even if you're a big multinational corporation. But that 10 to not bump that you see in the active time zone, but is absent in the inactive time zone, means that we're making a difference. We're seeing more ships transit at that 10% at that 10 knot speed in order to make the whale, uh, make the ocean safer for whales. And you can see below that graph, this is just kind of the bars through time of the the top bar is the maximum average speed, the bottom bar is the uh, minimum uh, average speed, and that middle bar is the average speed through time for conglomerated across all the transits in Southern California. And you can see kind of around 2018, the program really kicks off and we see those kind of, that we see those speeds kind of drop down to where we need them to be. So the program that Jess has been implementing through this whole time has been super successful even though it took a couple of years to carry on, but we're still not at all these ship transits making, uh, making it under this 10 and 12 knot barrier. So we're looking towards the future of how to actually get to this important level because some of the modeling work by our other research partners are showing that we need to have complete compliance in order to do, have a significant impact on the whale recovery for blue whales. Go ahead, Jess. Um, 
And so this is looking at three different um, chips. So that IMO number is like an ID number uh, through time. So the dot is the average speed of a transit through that TSS zone. And we're looking at three ships that have participated in every VSR we've ever had since 2014. And you can see in the beginning, there's these early ship speeds in blue for this uh, 002, where you're seeing these high transits. And then in 2014, right before that 2015 mark, we implemented the VSR program. And we saw a number of those transits drop down for, for ships that participated into that 12 knot range. And as time went on, we see more and more transits kind of trending down below this 12 knot and into this 10 knot range, which means for ships that have been participating in our programs through time, they're not only just participating when we ask them to, but we see those ship, those speeds come down overall and a general awareness in the community about the importance of traveling slow to protect whales. And you can see that island up at the top, that's Anacapa Island in our water, of which you can see how close those ships go to the sanctuary and to the island itself. Um, uh, next slide. I'll let you have it, Jess. All right, cool. We're very close to the end because I'm conscious of the fact that we probably don't have time, a lot of time, I should say, for questions. Um, but before we wrap up, I did want to mention the last focus um, or approach by sanctuaries on this conservation work. Um, and that's just to support ongoing research and monitoring. Um, I think it goes without saying that we can't really properly protect these species of concern if we don't understand their distribution and their density um, or try to track them in real time or predict where they're gonna be. And so in Southern California, that means monthly aerial surveys of the shipping lanes. Um, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary runs a program to make sure that that happens. Um, and the goal right there is really just to see what and how many animals are present in these shipping lanes and if we need to adjust the timelines and the vessel speed reduction requests that I was explaining before. Um, and then on the right in Northern California, it means supporting boat-based surveys um, that provide really important data that can help uh, inform and improve the fine scale modeling work that we're doing. Um, to again, help us understand where whales are gonna be and where hotspots of activity exist. And then before we officially wrap up, since at least for me, I like to know how I can contribute to a problem when I end one of these talks, um, I would do want to leave you with a couple of things that we'd love to see from you as the listeners, if you feel so inclined and inspired by this conversation. Um, but if any of you have the privilege of being out on the water, or even near the water where you can see whales from the coast, um, definitely encourage and ask you to download the Ocean Alert app um, to contribute whale sightings data whenever you see them. That comes directly to us. Um, it is a free app. It used to be named Whale Alert. Now it's called Ocean Alert. Um, it's really easy to use, honestly. There's no need to have any whale sighting experience. Even if you just report that you saw a whale and you don't know what kind it is, that's helpful for us to know. Um, so that's my first recommendation. And then second, uh, definitely help us raise awareness on ship strikes if you can. Not many people spend time thinking about any of the threats um, that whales face, but definitely I think less think about the ship strike side of things. Um, I think most of us don't really wonder how our toothbrush or our laptop or our Peloton bike arrived in our homes. So help spread the word please that this is a major contributor to whale death on our coastlines and around the world. Um, and it's definitely only becoming a bigger problem as ships get faster and bigger. Um, and as we keep ordering more and more stuff as Americans, there are more container ships out there to meet that demand that we're putting out. Um, so maybe buy less too. <laughs> um, but I, the third thing, if you wanna be a watchdog on this work, on the vessel speed reduction work, um, definitely invite you to check out the link that you see that is a website that's managed by UCSB friends um, at the Benioff Ocean Initiative. And the cool thing with that site is they not only manage a hydrophone so that you can get real time whale detections for the region, but they also uh, have made a dynamic 
compliance monitoring system essentially with the AIS data so you can get an idea at any time how these big shipping companies are performing with these vessel speed reduction requests. And then related to that, if you have favorite brands that you reach out to ever, if you have connections in the retail world with companies that put a lot of containers on these container ships, um, if you can talk to your favorite brands about prioritizing whale, shape, whale safe shipping practices, that would be hugely helpful. We know from years of talking to these companies that the most influential thing we can do right now is convince the big name retailers out there, Walmart, Target, all of these guys who are putting a lot of shipping containers on these big container ships. Um, if we can get them to be more aware of this, then we can get a lot of the companies to be a lot more motivated to cooperate. Um, and with that, I will stop talking and I think we're happy to take questions if we've left any time for them. Thank you, Jessica and Ryan. Appreciate the- Yeah, Maury, I think uh, even though we went a little bit late, it looks like there's some questions in there. So uh, yeah, we, we can go longer if you guys can. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Let's do it. Yeah, we have time for questions. Um, unfortunate to learn how much the ship strikes are affecting the whale population. So I'm sorry to hear that. Um, let's see what questions people have. Um, so Paige wants to know um, if the speed limits uh, can be manda mandated in some of the areas like harbors, um, since you have the data to confirm uh, compliance or no compliance. Um, they can be if mandates are put into place. There are areas in the world where speeds are mandated to be slow. Um, Right now, a lot of the effort in the United States have been to, um, at least on the West Coast, have been for compliance to be uh, incentive programs or voluntary efforts. There are mandated speed zones on the West Coast for northern right whales, which is a critically endangered population. And Jess will know the number, but I believe it's around 60 so individuals. Um, so there are places where mandated uh, ship speeds are in effect and we see greater compliance. It's one of the things that Jess and I are working on is doing a cross comparison of mandated incentivizing voluntary measures. Um, but to date, there just hasn't been anything like that implemented on the West Coast. Got it. Yeah, I think you had, someone else had a similar question along the same lines of um that regulations are more mandated on the west coast I mean, on the east coast i'm sorry possibly is there anything that um uh, voting or representatives can do on the west coast to help with um the regulations over here <laughs> um, i can try to chime in a little bit ryan go ahead. um i i mean it's a tough question um because i, I think a lot of i mean everything um, that NOAA does in terms of policy action is driven by legislation that directs or mandates NOAA to respond to certain issues or events. Um, and so right now, as Ryan mentioned, for the really critically endangered North Atlantic right whale population, there is enough political will and justification and data, first and foremost data is really prevalent on that coast. Um, with the right whale side because right whales float actually conveniently when they're hit and killed um, and they're also much closer to shore in general so there's just a lot more evidence amassed that ship strikes are an issue which helped pave the way for um, these actual regulations to get into place um, on the west coast with blue whales we know that they are a critically endangered population but like we've been talking about the data doesn't necessarily support putting regulations into place at this point under Endangered Species Act terms at least. Um, but one thing I know that's being looked at at least in Northern California where the National Marine Sanctuaries have much larger jurisdiction than in Southern California where Channel Islands exists um, is whether under the National Marine Sanctuaries Act that could be something that gets put into the next management plan potentially if there's will and interest in doing so. So it's definitely being talked about. I actually really appreciate the group 
proposing those questions and thinking about that. Um, but at this stage, we are still working with this voluntary approach um, and having these internal conversations on whether regulations make sense for the future. Yeah, we had a lot of people uh, comment about how they could help out. So thank you for adding some clarification to that. Um, a few people want to know about um, how the ship strikes are reported um, and if they're required to be re reported um, and sort of that on the data side. Yeah, so I can take that one. Um, are they required to be reported? I think probably technically, but really hard to enforce making sure somebody tells you when they hit a whale, especially with a container ship. Um, honestly, for most of the ship strike cases that we even get to record and put in that data that I showed you in those maps, um, we suspect that most of the large ships don't even know that they hit a whale because as we've been talking about, these ships are so large that they really do make blue whales look small. Um, and so we've actually looked with some of the companies when we know that the events have happened to see if in their engine logs, we can detect any changes that show that the ship strike has occurred, but it's really uncommon for the large ships to even know it's happened. Um, so even though we encourage them telling us whenever it's possible, it's just really rare that it happens. Um, and so the majority of the data that populates the maps that we were showing earlier is a result of whales washing up on the yeah. beach and then us bringing in teams of people who are trained to actually do these animal autopsies to determine the cause of death. And so we're really, I mean, that's another point related to um, the data set and the limits of what I was showing earlier. Um, we're not only limited in the number of whale carcasses that are even available to check out, but we're also limited in the number of groups that can go on a short notice to these often really hard to get to places on our coastlines and determine, okay, this whale has internal hemorrhaging and a broken spine. And so that's consistent with a ship strike. So it's definitely a huge challenge to actually get accurate data on the issue for that reason. Yeah, um, and a couple, a couple people, thank you. Um, a couple people mentioned a sort of similar, um, had similar questions about the uh, the channels and if the if the boat the boat channels could be moved or how that process sort of works to go out of the way of whales. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? One more time. Sorry. Sorry. A, a couple of people have asked about um, the the ship lanes and if they can be moved or rerouted to avoid whales. Can you touch on that a little bit more? Yeah. Jess, you want me to start with that? Sure. Um, so the routes are set by the Coast Guard and the process they use to decide where those routes are is called PARS. And back, as Jess kind of talked about, in Channel Islands, there's the traffic separation scheme. So there's a northbound traffic, which was on the north side, and the southbound traffic was on the south side. And that TSS, this like space between, is basically like the divider and the highway. So it's to make sure that in case something goes wrong, that the ships have a little bit of area where they can turn and not be at risk of hitting each other. And what we did back in that first PARS process was to shrink down the TSS. So basically the, to bring the divider narrower so we could actually lift that southbound lane traffic out of big whale habitat. So it's a little difficult because as climate changes or as the habitat changes, where whales are gonna feed is sort of dependent on where the food is, which is a dynamic space. So we revisit these kind of spatial orientations um, every couple of years. And so we get it, there's a new PARS coming up and we'll be, input, we'll be bringing the best and newest models of where whales are to try and direct where traffic goes. There's other interests and other things that get to weigh in on that PARS process, including the safety of the ships themselves. Um, they don't wanna to go too close to the islands or you can't put them in areas where oil rigs are. Um, there's also naval activity in Southern California that you can't disrupt. So there's a whole bunch of interests that kind of weigh in on these processes to understand where these routes can go. And in some areas, you just can't put things. As Jess sort of mentioned before, the really difficult things is the whales can't make up their minds. So they're different by species of where those hotspots are. 
And if you move something to protect blue whales, you potentially move it into gray whale habitat or into fin whale habitat. So finding that tight area is difficult and often dynamic, which is why we try and give the best information to the Coast Guard that we can in order to get the best fit. But there's never going to be a perfect fit for these kinds of, of spatial limits that we put in. Um, Jess, do you know how often PARS is? Is it 10 years? I don't think it's on a set timeline. I think it's as needed. And they've done it on the East Coast. They've done it on the West Coast before, but they're redoing it for the West Coast. It stands for a Port Access Route Study. So it's like our domestic version of establishing shipping routes off of our coastlines. Um, and one thing that Ryan mentioned that is a little frustrating is that the whales are dynamic and they keep moving, but these timelines for actually establishing the shipping routes are really not dynamic. They're very slow. Um, so the Coast Guard does its own process. And then, as I mentioned before, if you wanna move international shipping lanes, you actually have to go through this UN process and body um, at the International Maritime Organization. And it usually takes at best about a year and a half and usually around two to three years, I would say, to actually get your proposal in and then the changes enacted so that international traffic knows where they're supposed to be. Um, and so that's, that's the challenge is that moving the shipping lanes away from whales is definitely the best solution, but it's hard to do in a timely manner. So that's why the vessel speed reduction requests are such an important piece of the puzzle to try to address in the short term some of this more dynamic uh, whale presence. Great. Um, so I just want to jump in here really quick. Someone had a question of where this recording will be available if they want to review it later. Um, you can find all our webinars at cirweb.org forward slash webinars. I will put that link uh, in the chat as well. Uh, we have time for a few more questions here. Um, Someone asked a great question. Uh, I don't know if you either of you can touch on this a little bit, but it's relevant to the audience. Um, do you know why whales are uh, ecologically important uh, to protect their, uh, their significance to the marine and coastal ecosystem? So it, I think a lot of times we think about whales and their protection because people just love whales. Um, and so I think people sort of underestimate how important they are to the ecosystem. Um, whale poop alone is one of the biggest nutrients that feed phytoplankton and one of the biggest single contributors to oxygen production on the planet. So phytoplankton are way more important to oxygen production and slowing and carbon exchange and slowing climate change than we think about forests. We just sink so much more carbon with phytoplankton and whale poop is one of the number one ways that those blooms happen. So when we think about saving whales, there's a huge climate change aspect to that as well. In addition, there are indicators of a healthy ocean and where they go helps us understand what areas are important to protect. Um, in addition to the ecological benefits of which Jess will know way more than I do, um, they support important economies, whale watching and going to see whales is a big draw for people to come to the West Coast. So in addition to the ecology of it, we know that these whales are supporting big economies. They're drawing people to these areas. People come to Monterey, people come to Channel Islands to go see whales. It's one of the number of ways people interact with this sanctuary system is to come see these magnificent animals. Great. I don't have much to add on that one, but I'll say that, I mean, I love whales just because I really love whales and all my friends and family watching know that that's been true for a very long time. But on top of that right now, obviously, as needed, the attention's on climate change and how we can try to sequester carbon or reduce carbon emissions overall. But one thing that whales definitely contribute to is sequestration of carbon globally. Um, they're actually enormous carbon sinks, so places where we can actually store carbon and then even when they die, it captures carbon that actually goes to the bottom of the ocean rather than released into our atmosphere like we really don't want it to right now. Um, so that's another actually big push right now for the justification for saving whales is based around those carbon benefits as, as well. And, and Adam, I'm going to add on to that point real quick. 
when whales fall to the deep ocean, those create something that scientists call very brilliantly and intuitively whale falls, which when they hit the deep water, whole ecosystems thrive on that meat coming down. So hagfishes, these inverts, the deep water ecosystem we think is really fed by this dying life at the surface that comes down. So even though we think about them as kind of at the top of the food chain, there's no real predators here. When they die, they are supporting a whole ecosystem that's thousands of feet down, miles down. Um, and they are one of the important food sources for that whole community. Without them, um, it would really limit the kind of energy that goes down into that system. Great, great, great insight. Um, we had a couple of people who wanted to know, uh, we have time for one more question, but if people want to contact you, what is the best way to uh, do that? The easiest way I think for people to remember off the top of their heads is the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. If you look it up on Google, we have a website and both of our emails are going to be listed there. And that's the easiest way to contact us. Um, our emails are also listed in this presentation. So if you go back to the front, email is the easiest way to get hold of Jess or I if you have any follow up questions. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and then I'm going to ask one more question here. I'm not sure if you mentioned it in the talk, but we had a couple people um, who wrote in uh, and wanted to know, so has the, partic as the participation has increased in the uh, not reduction, has that also correlated to a decrease in the collisions? Um, I'm not exactly sure if this was touched upon or how. So it's really difficult to understand how much reduction is when you think about it in terms of we were reducing risk. So as just pointed out, one of our collaborators and, and great scientific partners at Point Blue did a big modeling study looking at kind of modeling out the average speed, looking at where whales were going. And through this kind of modeling exercise, we got to some idea of how many strikes were happening. As Jess said, it's hard to know because the, whale, the whales typically sink. We don't really have bodies to quantify. Um, and we don't really have an understanding of when whales are hit unless they wash up on a beach and we can autopsy and look, look at the tissue or they come in on the bow of these big ships. So it's hard for us to know or be able to like have a body count because the amount of times that we see um, dead whales is pretty limited. So we cannot say for sure if we are looking at a complete reduction, but the modeling of that risk shows that the decreased speeds were improving by a certain percentage based on modeling effort. Um, so the, and that's a really complicated answer to basically say, we're pretty sure this is making a big difference, but it's hard to know for sure because it's hard to get a count of how many bodies or how many whales are being killed by ships, period. Mm -hmm. And I'll just very much agree with that answer and say, I mean, when we were looking at that map before that showed you the dots of all the ship strike events that are recorded, um, I was also mentioning that things like the people who are available to actually go and do these autopsies of these animals to determine if it's a ship strike event, that's sometimes limited. So it's really hard to look at the strandings data and try to get a clear picture of what's actually happening. I mean, it's really important for us to look at it because we know if recorded events are extremely high, we can assume they're potentially even 10 times larger in terms of actual occurrence based on these models, but we should monitor them essentially. But like Ryan said, we can't really determine what the situation is looking like right now, at least based on the data that we have available. Even 2020, I'll say for COVID reasons, our numbers are incredibly low for ship strike events. And it's not a huge surprise because we didn't have teams mobilized and available to go do these site visits on the whale carcasses. So it's a challenge. So it is a tough answer, but Ryan, like Ryan was noting, the models um, from our research partners are really the best way to determine if reduction in risk is happening. Um, and that's unfortunately all we have to work with right now. Okay, well, I think uh, we'll end it at that. Sorry we couldn't get to every question, but those were really great questions that, that were submitted. And you folks were wonderful, wonderful information. Thank you for joining us again. And I just want to remind everyone that you can find this webinar on our website in a few days at um, cirweb.org 
slash forward slash uh, webinars. So I don't know, CIRweb.org slash webinars. And also you can find it on Facebook. Just look up Channel Islands Restoration or on YouTube, Channel Islands Restoration. So um, thank you guys for joining us again and uh, for all the participants. And keep up the good work, folks. You're doing a great job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. And hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Good evening, everyone.